Okay, welcome everyone to our next lecture on causality. Today, we talk about Bayesian networks and Markov's properties of Bayesian networks. So this is a non-causal topic, but somehow I think we haven't talked so much about the details. I think for the second lecture, where uh, when I was ill, I was pointing to two videos from the machine learning lecture where there were some basics about probabilities and there was also some basics about Bayesian networks. But maybe you didn't watch it, so since I told you, you don't have to watch the Bayesian network stuff. So now's the time to learn about Bayesian networks. We use them intuitively kind of already by drawing graphs of structural causal models. Um, however, additionally to the structural causal models, there's also the Bayesian networks. Like historically, the Bayesian networks in a way in Julia Pearl's works are older. So they are more from the 90s. So there he wrote a book called, I think, probabilistic reasoning in intelligent systems, that was all about Bayesian networks. And there are a couple of um, sections also on causal interpretation of Bayesian networks, but that work came later, after that one. So we go back into the past, and I will tell you all about Bayesian networks, why they are useful, and what they are designed for, okay? Um, so, basically, I'm trying to follow again the book from Peters, Peters Jansing and Schulkopf, um, where I'm following, okay, these uh, Markov property and causal minimality, these, these chapters, they, these sections, they are basically from the book, and the other ones, they are from my lecture in machine learning, okay? So it's the same that I'm also teaching there. So Bayesian networks, what are they? They are not a causal model, but they are closely related. So in a nutshell, a Bayesian network is also a graph that defines a probability distribution, that's it. But the graph is not necessarily telling us something about the causal relationships. Why having a graph? We see that in a second, why that might be a great idea. Um, since we are computer scientists, we know a lot about graphs. In particular, we can look at properties of the graphs, like incoming edges or some other separation criteria, and we could try to understand what that means for the corresponding probability distributions. And so it would be nice if there are some certain properties that we can see from the graph and then infer something about probability distribution. And maybe we did that already by saying, so in the graph, these nodes are not connected, so they are independent of each other, okay? And this will be made more precise today. So first, the uh, motivation for using graphs at all is suppose you have a joint distribution and now of some propositional variables A to Z. So those are, <coughs> excuse me, 26 random variables and propositional just means they are Boolean, so they have either value 0 or 1 or true and false. And the joint distribution of 26 variables is as many, many, many free parameters. So basically, for all combinations, 2 to the 26, I need to store a single real number, okay? The last one I get for free by saying 1 minus the rest, okay? But I have to store 2 to the 26 minus 1, which is a gigantic amount of memory, yeah? So is it an unreasonable thing to ask that we want to talk about such a distribution? No, it's not. So think of a medical application. There's a medical doctor and she's asking the patient certain things, whatever, where, does it, where is it painful, okay, in, in, the, in the foot? And then maybe some other questions. So do you have a flu? Do you have this or that? What's the color of your hair? So many questions. So you can easily collect 26 random variables and it would be nice to have a joint probability distribution on those because that might guide us if some of the variables might be symptoms and some other might be illnesses. So if we have a joint probability distribution, we could use such a distribution to do basically medical analysis by asking for symptoms and then we do probabilistic inference and it would say, say us the probability of having corona is super high or something or maybe you have a, your, your, your a broken leg or whatever, some other obvious things. So these probability distributions will arise, so 26 is not many. However, here the computer will already um, need quite a bit of storage. So how could we specify the joint distribution now with fewer numbers? And there the basic idea is that not everything is relevant for everything else. For example, if I have a running nose, so that might be a sign that I'm having a, a flu, but it won't tell me anything whether I have a broken leg or not, right? And whether my, my leg looks funny doesn't tell me whether I have a flu. So there are some variables which are like separated. And so it's very natural maybe to make a big graph where you draw an edge between nodes that are like variables that have something to do with each other. 
So here's a simple toy example. I think it's from Chris Barber's book from 2012. I think I didn't mention the reference. I think it's called Bayesian Inference and Machine Learning or something like that. So I should look it up. So it's a really nice book. And there he uses this uh, example, which is, I think, motivated also by examples from Julia Pearl in his book. So here's the story. So we have only four variables. So you are, you are owning a nice house, and so you're having a lawn around your house, so with grass, OK? And your name is Tracy, so your grass could be wet, yes or no. So that's the first random variable. The second random variable is whether it has rained or not last night. And we know we are domain experts, so if it rains, the grass will be wet. Yeah, for sure. It's another Boolean variable. And here's another one. Tracy's sprinkler was on last night. So a sprinkler is a thing that you use in the summer that you uh, put on the grass to wetten it. So that's a sprinkler. And um, that's, of course, another reason why the w grass could be wet. So we immediately see kind of the structure of the story already in our head. Um, and let's say we also take the grass of Tracy's neighbor, Jack, into the game here and have yet another variable, whether the neighbor's lawn is also wet. OK? So this is a simple toy example. Let's count the number of parameters of the joint distribution. So in principle, we could just say 2 to the 4 is 16, minus 1 is 15. So we need 15 parameters. And you can also do the counting differently by applying the product rule. We can factorize it in any variable ordering. So no what matter what you pick first. For example, we could per first pick the s. p of s is one part of this. And then p of r, given s, is another part of this product. And if you multiply those two, you get the joint distribution of r and s. And then similarly, conditioning on R and S, and then having a probability distribution for the J is a third term and a fourth term. So this is just applying the product rule three times. Let's count the number of parameters. So P of S requires a single parameter, right? Because there are two possibilities, single parameter. P of R given S, it has two parameters because I need to store P of R being equal to one given that S is equal to one, and I need to store P of R being equal to one given that s is equal to 0. And all the other values I can calculate, right, with 1 minus the other value. So basically, I need to count how many cases are there for the condition, OK? And that is the number of, uh, z minus 1 is the number of, uh, no, z not minus 1. Uh, that is the number of parameters. Is that right? No. Yeah, OK. So I'm conditioning on nothing, so there's only one case, so I have one parameter. Yeah, I'm conditioning on a Boolean variable, so I have two parameters, right? Because I need to store for r being equal to one, one number. Here I'm having four possibilities, so I get four parameters. And here I'm giving two to the three, eight parameters, OK? So in total, it will be eight plus four plus two plus one parameters. So far, so simple. Luckily, this is 15. OK, great. However, let's now use our domain knowledge. Let's leave out some irrelevant content, OK? So for example, OK, there might be a certain probability that the sprinkler is on. I think we can't get, a, can't get around that one. But what about the next one? What is the probability that it rained last night conditioned on that the sprinkler was on last night? So that are, those are independent events, right? Of course, depending on if it's summer, right, then we might be more likely to have the sprinkler outside. And maybe that makes it more likely that it does not rain or that it does rain. But let's assume for the story that all year around we have the same climate, kind of, and so it's always equally likely that it's raining. And then so the rain is independent of the sprinkler being on last night. So it's a waste to put here a condition on S in here. So it's better to just omit it, because P of R given S equals 1 is the same as P of R given S equals 0. So it doesn't help us. OK, what about the next one? Um, the probability that Jack's grass is wet um, does not depend on whether Tracy's sprinkler was on, right? Because sprinkler makes only the lawn of Tracy wet and not of Jack. So we can also omit basically the sprinkler variable here for Jack's uh, grass. However, the rain is important, so we need to keep it in. Um, next one. So now the probability that Tracy's grass is wet, it depends on whether it has rained and whether it's the sprinkler is on. So here we can't do anything. So let's count the number of parameters. So this one is. One possibility, one plus two plus four. And this is only eight parameters, which is great. So how did we do this? So we got rid of some 
irrelevant con conditions, and that kind of was limiting the um, possibilities, and so we have to store fewer parameters. Um, of course, by now it should be obvious that you can vi visualize this also as a graph, right? So this is exactly like the um, conditional probability distributions that we used for the structural causal models. Uh, that's why one could maybe also give this lecture way before all the other stuff. But I like it more to start right away with something causal. And then maybe now you are motivated to go through this stuff as well, since you know that it's useful for something. So we can visualize it as a graph. So if you are not conditioned on anything, like R and S, you don't have any incoming edges. And if you are conditioned on something, then the conditions are your incoming edges. So this is the graphical representation of this factorization. And of course, we can also write down these eight numbers that then define the probability distribution. So there might be one that it's raining, depends on where you live, whether you're living in California or in Dortmund. And it might also be a probability distribution whether you put the sprinkler outside or not, whether it's running, maybe there's also some um, probability. And then of course, if it rains, the lawn will be wet of Jack and similarly for Tracy's grass. So if one of them is on, then the grass should be wet. Maybe if the sprinkler is on, maybe there's a chance that it's not getting wet for whatever reasons. Yeah, maybe it was falling over or something. So this is like a reasonable description of the joint probability distribution now with fewer numbers, which is nice. Okay. Now, how do we use it for inference? So this is our model now that we get from our domain expert and with the probability. So now how can we use it? We want to answer now some interesting scientific questions. So here's the first one. What is the probability that the sprinkler was on given that we observed that Tracy's grass is wet. So let's flip back. So Tracy's grass and the sprinkler, they have a really close connection, right? So probably if the sprinkler is on, um, it should be quite likely that the grass is wet. wet. However, when you see here, we also condition here on the R variable. So we cannot directly read this question off from this table. Instead, we need to integrate out the possibilities for the rain. So let's do it quite mechanically. So first of all, we rewrite now our query, which is the probability that the sprinkler was on, given that Tracy's grass is wet, as the joint distribution of the two variables divided by the condition. That's the first step. And then we can mechanically replace this pairwise distribution by the joint distribution of all variables, where we sum out the variables we are not interested in. Okay, so the first step is just the product rule. And then the second step is just using the sum rule. Okay, again, just these two basic rules. Where on top we have, we are summing out fewer variables than at the bottom. Great. Now, this can be plugged in, right? So we, here we have an expression for the joint distribution. And for all these ex sub expressions, we have the numbers in our table. So we can plug everything in and we do a computation to calculate something. Okay. And in this case, it turns out to be 0 0.33. OK, interesting. So um, there was a, a chance that it's wet because of the rain, right? So that's why it's not 100% sure that the sprinkler was on. So it could be that also the rain will explain that Tracy's grass is wet. So that's why the probability is not super high, because um, maybe it's more likely that it rains than that the sprinkler is on. Actually, when you look at this, so somehow this, when you compare it, this is like two third, and this is like one third of the explanation, right? So like hand wavily. The formulas are a bit more complicated, but just hand wavily, it's doubly likely that it was raining. So that the sprinkler was really on and making the grass, but it's only one third of the two possibilities here. But this is a bit hand wavy reasoning. So right re reasoning is that you really do the calculation up here. However, we see that a third is kind of something reasonable. OK, interesting. Let's have another query. By the way, what we are doing here is this is kind of AI, right? I mean, we're having here some domain expert telling us something about illnesses and symptoms or something. And we are modeling it with a very gigantic Bayesian network. And then suddenly we can ask questions. So given that the person has a flu, um, what is the probability that that's corona or something? OK, if we have such a model, we can answer these kind of questions. And so this is like a very nice expert system with probabilities, OK? So let's ask something else. So let's add something here. So here our knowledge is 
trace these grasses wet and we are interested in the probability that the sprinkler is on. Let's add something here that Jack's grass is also wet, okay? Now you are domain experts. If Jack's grass is wet, it should make it much more likely that it has rained. So if it has rained, it's much less likely that the sprinkler was on and that, that's the explanation. And if you go through the same calculation as before, it will turn out that the probability dropped by having this additional knowledge now, okay? Which is quite a nice effect. And this effect is called explaining away. So the rain is explaining away the reason for the sprinkler, uh, that the sprinkler is the reason for the wet grass, okay? Um, why is it such a big deal? Because typically in logic, yeah, we are reasoning monotonically, yeah? So if you could infer that the sprinkler is on, if we infer it from a theory which has like the t equals one and we can infer s equals one, then if we add additional knowledge, we can still infer it. So we, it's a monotonic system. So you, you never can infer fewer things in logic. Yeah? But with probabilities, these things can change and they can go up and down, which is quite nice and which matches actually our intuition. Okay? So it gives us some way of doing non-monotonic reasoning in a very nice fashion. Okay? Good. So far, so good. Here's some other interesting note here. Note that um, the sprinkler being on and Jack's grass being wet are independent of each other. Yeah? They have nothing to do with each other. However, once I observe that Tracy's grass is also wet, suddenly they are not independent anymore, but now they are dependent because now it's very likely that it was the rain that was causing one, okay? And then the sprinkler gets less likely, okay? Okay, so what do we have now? We have an some real world examples, so those could be illnesses or symptoms, or it could be whatever you're working for a company and you define a couple of events, like let's say one event could be that this company brought a new product out and this is are your sales numbers and this is something else and something else. And then if you are a domain expert, you could might be able to draw a network of all of this and see how everything influences everything. Then you need to specify some reasonable probability tables and then you can do logical inference with it, okay? With probabilities, which is super useful. Of course, you could ask, so where do I get these numbers here? Those numbers are numbers that you could, for medical data, for example, could infer from patient records. So that would be one option. That's an option. Or you use it with ball, by eyeballing. So you estimate just some numbers. You're trying to put here stuff that you can easily maybe estimate where you have a good feeling for, okay? So, and we have a good feeling that Jack's grass is wet when it rains. So we put a one. Okay, fine. And maybe we could think of something that could happen if it's not raining and if the sprinkler falls over or sometimes maybe there's a bug in the, in the software or something that even the sprinkler was on, the switch was on, the, the lawn wasn't wet. So maybe that's our experience. And then these probabilities here, they are now quite non-trivial. We cannot just say, so what is now the probability of this and that? And there, so that's the complicated part here. Okay, so quite a useful system. So now what is probabilistic reasoning or probabilistic inference in this case? Um, we are given some observations and then we ask, what is the probability of another event? How do we do this? We identify all relevant variables, then we define the joint probability. And for this, we typically draw a graph and we assign these CPTs, these conditional probability tables, and by this specifying the full joint. Then we calculate, um, oh, then we have our evidence, so this observation is also called evidence, so that's what we are observing, and then we can infer the new probability distribution in a non-trivial way using the rules that I just showed you, yeah? And um, I don't know, do you know Cluedo, this game, where you need to find out who's done it? some murder or mystery thing. So go ahead, try it, right? So you could have a graphical model maybe that that person did this and that or that this guy, I know he's always lying or something and you can try to do a probabilistic inference. Actually, it's not so easy because it's unclear what the causal directions is. So maybe this Cluedo game is too simple, but maybe one could imagine a more complicated game where you need to infer, okay, if that was the reason for that one and that for that one, maybe there is a graphical structure in there, okay? 
it's a bit like Sherlock Holmes type of thing. Yeah. So you think, okay, if that happens, that happens. And then Sherlock Holmes thinks, so the most likely person will be the gardener, right? for example. Okay, so far so good. So this is probabilistic reasoning. Now let's give it a name. So this is a typical definition found, for example, in Barber and also in Pearl's book. And I don't like it so much. Um, I show it to you because that's a possible way to define it. But then I show you another one which I prefer. So one way to de uh, define it is without explicit talking about the graph. So we could say a Bayesian network is a distribution that can be written as a certain factorization. And this factorization now, we would interpret the conditions as parental variables for a given variable. So it makes sense, yeah? A Bayesian network now can be represented as a directed acyclic graph, where the graph is defined by these parent sets. So that's reasonable. However, if we define it like that, then a Bayesian network is a distribution, for example, this joint distribution. However, there might be two different graphs which describe it. And I prefer if I call the graph the Bayesian network together with the conditional probability tables. I think that's nicer because then this is a different Bayesian network from that one because one is the error is going from one to two and for the other one the other way around. So that's why I don't I'm not super happy with this distribution uh, with this definition up here. So here's a better one which I prefer. So a Bayesian network is a DAG. Okay, so it's a graph where my vertices are random variables and I'm giving n functions. So this is like having these assignments, but in this case these functions are actually um, PDFs, okay, so they integrate up to one. So and these functions can be used as conditional PDFs for node j given some parents, okay? And now I'm saying, so you have a graph and some probability distributions and that is a Bayesian network. However, it's super close, the, the definitions are super close and they are not really talking about something else, they're talking about the same thing. So, so far so good. Um, and in a way, this definition is simpler than a structural causal model. So it's only telling us something about the probability distributions, but not necessarily how the data was generated, okay? In particular, for a joint distribution of two variables, there are two different Bayesian networks which both describe the same probability distribution, yeah? So we can also define now this joint distribution, which is not part of this de definition up here, to be just a product of these conditional PDF, so that is the joint distribution. So a Bayesian network induces a joint distribution, but two different Bayesian networks might induce the same joint distribution, okay? So far so good? I think so, otherwise you please interrupt me. Okay, um, let's study it further. So curiously, the product rule can be applied to any joint distribution, right? I just need to keep all other variables in here, yeah? And the curious thing, any permutation of my variable would generate a different factorization, right? So I could first apply the product rule to the last variable and then to the second last and so on and so forth, and I get this factorization. However, I could choose a different ordering here written as this pi of j, which is a permutation. Um, and this gives me another one. So both are examples of a fully connected DAG, right? There will be one node that is conditioned on nothing, yeah, that is kind of the origin, and then there will be one node, in this case node number two, which is conditioned on one, and then there's node number three, which is conditioned on one and two, and so on and so forth. So at the end, we will have a fully connected graph. So in principle, we see, by applying the product rule for different permutations, any fully connected ga uh, DAG yeah, is a different Bayesian network, okay? And it could also differ, of course, in the joint distributions, but um, for a given joint distribution, um, we have basically as many um, Bayesian networks as there are fully connected DAGs. And by um, noting here the permutation, you see how many there are. There are as many as there are permutations which are, I, if I'm not mistaken now, n factorial, right? I think that's right. So for the first, in the permutation for the first spot you have n choices, for the second spot you have n minus one choices and so on and so forth, which is n factorial. 
of course, these Bayesian networks are not super interesting, right? Because they have as many parameters as the other, as, as the full joint distribution. So you don't save anything. Okay, here is a fully connected graph, and that's also a description of our um, network. However, here we didn't leave out any errors. However, once we leave out errors, we are much more efficient, and then we get some nice representation. So now, curiously, we discussed it already. Our intuition was like the rain is independent of the sprinkler. Yeah, that's our intuition. That's kind of why we dropped the condition here. The question now here is, of course, could we also infer something like that from the graph, right? By looking at the graph, we could say, okay, R and S are independent because of the graph structure. Yeah, so the ordering before was we had this joint distribution J of R comma S, and then we were arguing that the S could be dropped from our story. And then after that, then we said, okay, this factorization corresponds to the graph down here. Now the question is, can we talk now graph language and then characterize these independencies? And the answer is yes. And by the way, do you know this stuff already or is it new to you somehow? Somehow known already from other lectures? Okay, base rule. Okay, yeah, that's already good foundation. Okay, so that's so then then there's some someone who learned something new here. That's great. And you have seen Bayesian networks before. Mm, yeah. You've seen them. Ah, okay, okay, great. Now then, let's have some more extended introduction. That's good. Okay, so far we only talked about this representation. Okay, probability distributions can be represented more efficiently, more memory efficiently with a Bayesian network. And there's also a nice algorithm to do the computation. By the way, there's even a super nice algorithm. So this is the algorithm that always works, but there are really nice algorithms that go along the graph that are also computationally more efficient. Okay, there's a so-called click, uh, click tree algorithm that can also do these kind of inferences, which is calculating all these sums and products in a super efficient way along the graph, where you kind of minimize the number of products and sums that you need to do. But that's a topic we are not talking about here. But So it's memory efficient and it's also time efficient when you run like these kind of computations. However, we now look at it more abstractly and we want to learn what can we learn from this graph structure. So how can we read off independencies? And for this, Here's a quick reminder of statistical independence, how it was defined. So typically, two random variables are defined to be independent if the joint distribution factorizes into marginal distributions, yeah? where marginal here kind of means Randverteilung. So this is a joint distribution, gemeinsame Verteilung, and those are the marginal ones. Looks like some people have problems with the word marginal distributions. If I have a joint distribution of three variables and I'm integrating out one, I'm also getting a marginal distribution of two remaining variables, right? So marginal distribution doesn't always mean that only one variable remains, but that I integrated out some of the variables. So that is a marginal distribution, okay? Okay, so far so good. So if they factorize like this, we say they are independent. Um, curiously, if we are allowed to divide by P of A, yeah, we also get this equation that the conditional probability of A given B is also just the probability of A, so B could be dropped. However, we can only write this if we can divide by, in this case, by P of B, because otherwise the conditional distribution is not defined, okay? We also have a special notation for this, A is independent of B, okay? So we can also say B doesn't give any information about A and vice versa, yeah, whatever that means. Typical example, I have two coins, I throw it here, don't show you the result, I throw it here, and then even if I tell you the result from the left coin, you don't know anything about the other one, and vice versa, okay? So far, so easy. However, there's a more general concept called conditional independence. And conditional independence now is saying two variables are conditionally independent given another variable, okay? However, the rest is the same. Just all expressions are now conditioned on C. As you know by now already, if I have a probability distribution of A and B, for example, P of A comma B, that is one probability distribution. But if I have actually another random variable and if I have a joint distribution of A, B, and C, there are other joint distributions of A and B. There's the joint distribution of A and B given C equals one, 
and maybe c equals zero, and maybe c could be also reevaluated or whatever. And so this is just a usual independent where everything is now conditioned on c. Okay, so in a way the other one is a special case conditioned on the empty set. Yeah. So we also have a nice notation for that one. It's a is conditioned uh, is independent of b conditioned on c. Yeah. Where again you could ask for the brackets here, and the brackets are that a is independent of b, so that is put into brackets and then conditioned on c. Why? Because the condition on C is influencing the distribution of A and B. Right? If you put the brackets the other way around, so for programming language fans, so if this thing binds more than this one, that would be strange. Then we would talk here about P of A, and here we would talk about P of B given C. Yeah? So this thing is binding stronger than the other one. OK, now comes the example. So this is a bit more complicated. Again, I'm having two coins. But again, I'm having a bell that I can ring if they show the same result. And so now for obvious reasons, um, or let's start with a simple one. A and B is independent, right? Sure. If I don't know anything about the bell, A and B are independent. Curiously also, A, the first coin, and whether I ring the bell or not is also independent, right? Because the bell is, will tell me exactly the result of the other coin. And since I, the one doesn't tell me anything about the other one, the A also doesn't tell me anything about the C. Similarly, B and C. However, now if I ring the bell, suddenly the two random variables are not independent anymore, right? Because if I know one, I know the other one. It's a toy example, but it's a nice one which kind of shows that things could be independent, and then when I condition on something, they are not independent anymore, okay? However, it's like in logic where you have get some additional theorem or you get some additional axiom, and suddenly you can make a certain conclusion that you will not be able to do before. Okay, so it's quite similar. Okay, so that's this example. Um, let's get back to our um, our wet grass. So here's again the joint distribution factorized and our CPTs. Yeah, I don't know. CPT really just means conditional probability table. I'm often use it but maybe it's jargon and I haven't properly defined it. So here's the graphical representation. Now we could ask the question, so what, what independencies could we infer only from the graph without looking at the numbers here? And for this now, um, we define something slightly more complicated. So where do we want to get? I show you, we want to get to this definition. And this is Perl's deseparation criteria. And that is a criteria on a DAG Okay, so here are no probabilities in here. Yeah, here's something that looks like independence, but it has a sub-index g. So this is the graph criterion here, and that is defined in this definition. What we mean by this? So this is a purely graphical criterion, and hopefully in a quarter of an hour we will be somewhere here, and I can explain to you on graph what does it mean to be deseparated. As a preview, deseparation is exactly the graph notion that is required to say something about a corresponding probability distribution. That is exactly the one that you need. And I think the deseparation was invented from Julia Pearl, as far as I know. So I think it's in his book, Probabilistic Reasoning in Intelligent System, where he introduced it, or in some of his papers. OK, so let's start step by step. Let's start with something simple. So ignore all of this down here. Let's just look at the first thing here. So this is our first graphical model, OK? So let's take the first graphical model. A arrow B arrow C, and it corresponds to this factorization, right? So the A has no incoming edge, so we have P of A. The B has only an incoming edge from A, so we have P of B given A, and then we have P of C given A. Of course, similarly, we can do for all other possibilities with arrows, we can write down the other factorizations, right? And now, having these factorizations, we can ask, so what independencies are implied by that one? by this factorization, okay? So in the first case, we can derive, it says, with elementary proofs, which means it will be an exercise, okay? You can derive that A and C are independent given B, okay? But I show you, I show you this case, okay? So that's A in one of the exercises maybe. So um, let me um, rewrite it here. So we have A, error B, error C that gives a certain joint distribution. Let's write it the other way around, P of A, 
P of B given A and P of C given B. And now I want to prove that A is independent of C given B. And here you see already intuitively it means the, the path from A to C is kind of split by B. So if I observe the B, some of the paths that, that connects A and C is um, separated. So they are kind of disconnected, so they don't communicate anymore with each other. Okay? So how do I show this? Any suggestions? How could I show it? So what do I have to prove if I want to show this independence? Yes, we use the definition. And I couldn't memorize everything you said, but you say the right thing. It is the definition. So let's, I'll try to write it now. So it's P of A given B times P of C given B. Yeah. Should be equal to P of A comma C given B. So this is what we need to show. Yeah. So this bang means that's what I want to show. Okay, so far so good. How are we doing this? Um, let's start with the one where there's more stuff in here, okay? So let's write the P of A, comma C given B. What facts can we use? The only facts we can use is this factorization that we have up here. However, if we want to use it, we need to have the joint distribution, okay? So let's turn it into the joint distribution. So this is P of A. A comma B comma C divided by P of B. Okay, so far so good. Let's plug it in and see where we get. So we have P of A times P of B given A times P of C given B divided by P of B. I hope you can read my handwriting. Okay. What does it buy us? Um, it still looks a bit complicated, but we have already one term, so that's nice. So this term over here, or maybe I should make it a bit more thick. Oh, let's use the marker. How about using the text marker? So that term is already that term, right? So we only need to show that P of A given B is equal to the term down here. Okay, or, and how do we do this? How do we show it? So let me get rid of this coloring thing. So this is what we need, that this is equal to that term. How can we show that? It's just base rule. It's just base rule, great. Well recognized. Now suppose we don't recognize it, okay? It's just base rule. And you could just say base rule and blah, blah, being equal to P of A, blah, 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 P of C given B, and you're done. But let's say you didn't see it, okay? What can you do? Um, okay, then let's say at least P of A times P of B given A is a joint distribution. So this is P of A comma B divided by P of B times P of C given B. And this is in the definition of the conditional distribution. So this is P of A <coughs> <coughs> and that's it. Excuse me. Okay. So far, so so good. Maybe you have to see it once. <coughs> okay, so now we've proven that in assuming that one, we know that A and C is independent given B. So the B is like interrupting the thing. Similarly, you can show also for the next two cases the same independence. Okay, looks like also here the, the information flow kind of is separated by the B. Okay, however, for the last one, um, we can derive something else. 
that A and C is independent given nothing, okay? By the way, how could you see that one? That is easier. This is just P of A times P of C, yeah? And by the sum rule, now how could you then change it? Yeah, you could multiply with that one. Uh, oh no, you should play around at home. So it's easier because here's a P of A and P of C is already factorized. So it's already almost done. You just need to clever you use some rule or product rule of something to get to this expression. So also from that one, you need to first use the sum rule to get all three variables. Then you can plug in everything and then you have every term and then you will sum out the B again and it's gone. Yeah. So you will have the sum rule, the sum summation sign in front of the joint distribution. Okay, that's how you get this joint distribution and then you plug everything in and then you can drag out the P of A and the P of C and the summation will sum out this conditional distribution and being equal to one and that's it, okay? Okay, without conditioning, so there's a difference now because of the directions of the arrows, okay? Um, so there are these three cases which are very much alike and then there's one case which is different, okay? So that's what we just proven with elementary proofs. However, these joint distributions do not necessarily imply dependences. So it doesn't mean that A and C are dependent, right? Why not? Because by choice of the probability distributions, we might forget the information of A. Maybe the A influences the B, but then the B has other properties that is then taken out with the C. So for example, let's say the B is a two-dimensional vector and the A is determining the first component and the second component is random in B, okay? And then the, from B to C is the second component. So then the A is independent of the C. But from the graphical structure, you can't see it. So this is implying certain independencies if there are errors missing. However, that does never imply dependencies, okay? Okay, so far so good. Um, so we found out that these three different cases, they imply different independencies. Now, what about this graph now? What can we infer from it? So we can infer certain things. For example, J and T is independent given R, right? This is given from case number three. So this has the same shape as from J to R to T. So we have the same directions of the arrows. And so we can just take these subnodes. So, okay, nice, we can read it off from the graph, kind of. Um, we can also infer that R and S are independent, right? That's also something. However, we can also show other things with more work on the next slide, that J and S are also independent given R and, yeah, given just R. So this is not nicely written here. So the comma here is, oh, this, this should be changed. So here should be like a big space. So it's only given R, the J and S are independent given R. The J and S is also independent given nothing and the J and S are also independent given R and T. So those I think are all possibilities. However, that's less trivial. So those two are now could be inferred just from our three cases that we up here. So let's generalize it. And a statement like J and S will be defined by looking at the path from J to S, okay? And now we could imagine Along the path now, we can always look at three nodes, and for the three nodes, we, we know what's happening. So for example, we could say, if R and S are independent, right, yeah, then something that is behind the R that has no direct connection to the, so the S is not directly connected to the J, but only via the R. So if R is already independent of S and everything else behind the R should be independent of S as well, right? since it might be connected with R, but not connected with the S directly, so it should be independent. Um, and this can be generalized with this definition. So now here's the definition. So let's first take the bird's eye view on it, okay? So here are the three cases that we've seen. They are kind of the same, right? And here's a different case that is slightly different, okay? And let's start to look at the small print, but let's look at the bottom. So we want to define that some subset of vertices A and B are de-separated by a third subset, S, okay? Written as like looking like the independence between variables. So 
This is defined, they are deseparated every pass from A to B is blocked by S. So that's it. So we need to consider all paths from A to B and check whether they are separated by S. That's it. So this definition up to here is if and only is, then comes a for all quantification, uh, like saying for all possible paths from A to B, A to B must be, the path must be blocked by some element of S. Now, how is it defined to be blocked by some element of S? By now we should have some intuition already, right? As I told you on the previous slide. So let's define that too. And that's the first part of the definition. We say a path between nodes is blocked by some other set whenever there's a node along the path such that one of the two possibilities hold. So either this special node along the path is in my blocking set and I'm having this case. Right? So those were the cases when I observed the middle variable, then the neighboring variables are independent. Those are exactly these top three cases. So that's one possibility to be blocked, that I have a long path, and there's one location along the path where the middle variable is observed, and I'm having these directions on the arrows. The other possibility is that I sub k, so the middle node, is not in S and I'm having incoming arrows to that one. So that's also blocking. Yeah, so that is a situation, oops, that um, R and S are independent, and thus S and J are also independent. Um, here's another little technicality, nor any of its descendant. So this is the strange technicality here. So neither I sub K is in S or any of its descendants. So why is that? So let me show you an example. Or oh, with example, I mean a, a sketch why that might, might make sense. So we're talking about A and B, and let's say we have this incoming errors to some node C, okay? This thing is also called, or I should make it, this is also called a collider, or also a V-structure. And speaking of those, um, I think something like this. What would be a good name for that one? Any suggestions? Chain. A chain, exactly. So that's a chain. And that one? That's a fork. You see now we, we develop this additional vocabulary, right? Because then when we look on a graphical model, then we could say, oh, there's a collider, there's a chain, there's a fork. So these are the properties of the probability distribution. So they give us some new language here. Let's look at the collider. Um, so for the collider, we know already that A is independent of B. But once we observe the C, A and B are not necessarily independent of each other, right? Think of the rain here and the sprinkler. And this was, I think, the lawn, the grass. And in principle, rain and sprinkler is independent. However, once I know the grass is wet, they are not independent anymore, but I'm getting this explaining away effect. So it can happen that if I now observe the sprinkler was on, the probability that it has rained drops. Okay? So it's curious, in this case, a is not independent anymore if I observe the C. Okay, so far so good, but now let's get to this weird additional assumption. So I want to say when is the pass blocked? When is the pass from A to, so this is the pass A to C to B. When is it blocked? It's blocked if the C is not observed then I don't have an explaining away effect, okay? Nor any of its descendants. So why is that interesting, having a descendant? So let's say, here's a descendant. If I observe that one, it will tell me, give me some information about the C as well, right? Because there's a direct connection from C to the D. So for example, um, Let's say um, in your house you see there are some 
some wet footprints all over your house, right? This is D. And D is, of course, influencing your belief whether the lawn was wet or not, right? Even though you don't know for sure whether the grass is wet outside, you observe some other variable, which kind of lets you infer, change the probability that the lawn is wet. And once you know something about the C, then A and B are not independent anymore. That's why a path A, C, B is only blocked if C is not observed nor any of its descendants. Well, this would be another descendant, of course, right? Or that would be another one. So those are descendants of C. That's why we need this technical thing. Neither I sub K nor any of its descendants is observed, is in the blocking set. Okay, again, so A and B is de-separated by a third subset F. It's every pass is blocked. Okay, so now if you are asked, please check what are the de-separations in this graph. You take two nodes, and then you need to check all possible paths between those nodes, and you need to check whether all paths are blocked. So you take the first path, and you check for any of these situations here. And once you find along the path any of these situations, you know that path is blocked, and then you take the next path, and you need to check it, okay? The curious thing now is this is a purely graph theoretic um, criterion. You don't need anything about probabilities here. This is only about the directions of the edges and about the sets of the vertices. That's it. Okay? So far so good? So this is de-separation. I think there will be a question. Oh, was there already a question in one of the first exercise sheets? No, I don't think so. But there will be one. So it's something to practice and then it's super useful. Okay, now what is the relationship between our graph criterion and probabilities? So we say, we define something. If we have a graph, G, okay, and a probability distribution, then we say the probability distribution is Markovian with respect to the graph G if for all subsets of my random variables, yeah, the deseparated sets are statistically independent. So with other words, if I see in the graph some deseparation, then this will imply a statistical independence on the joint distribution. Okay? In this case, we also say that this probability distribution satisfies the global Markov condition. Um, do I have an example here? Yeah, there will be an example. But um, the thing is, okay, let's take an example. Let's, let's draw an example. So suppose here's my joint distribution, and it's like fully general. So my factorization is really P of A times P of B given A. Oh, you can't see it. Sorry. Thanks for telling me. And P of C given B comma A. So I just applied the product rule. So there's no nothing I can omit. Yeah? And now here's my graph. So is that a nice G? No, kind of. So now suppose... This is my graph. Now, what deseparation do I have in here? Do I have any deseparations in this graph? Where do you have to look? You have to look for the edges where there's no edge. So you have to look for the missing edges. So can you formulate here some independence? No, not in deseparation in this graph. Any ideas? So A and B are probably not independent. They have a direct connection. B and C are probably not. So it must be something with A and C. And now A and C are independent given B. I, again, I've said independent because that's the same. It's defined like that. But I wanted to say it's deseparated. So what do I have to show for this one? So this is my first set of nodes, right? This is my second set. However, I'm omitting the brackets if there's only one node in, the, in there. And I need to check all paths from A to C. And there is only one path. And then for the path, I need to check, OK, along my path, do I have any of these blocking structures. And for this chain structure, I need to observe the node at the center, which I do in my set here. So 
they are deseparated. A and C are deseparated given B. So now, if my joint distribution is Markovian with respect to my graph, it would imply that A is independent of C given B, which implies that P of A given B times P of C given B is equal to P of A comma C given B. However, that is in general not the case. So if you have a general distribution where there's nothing missing, then you can construct a counterexample for this one. Okay? So this is this distribution is not Markovian with respect to that graph. Let's take an even simpler example. So let's say we have any distribution. And let's say this is my graph. And there are no edges. So what are the separations here? Who's separated from whom? Everyone from everyone, right? So A is separated from B, given nothing. So given the empty set, basically, right? And B is also deseparated from um, from C, and C is separated from A. However, in general, of course, I have dependencies between the variables. And only if this thing would factorize like this into its parts, then we could say this distribution is Markovian with respect to this graph. Okay. And then we also say P satisfies the so-called global Markov condition, right? And whereas the global Markov condition, there will be also a local one on the next slides. Okay, little proposition. The joint distribution that is induced by a Bayesian network with a particular DAG G is Markovian with respect to the DAG. So this is just by definition, just how we define everything. So Markov property. So we talked already about this global Markov property. Yeah. Um, curiously, so there's also a local one, and then there's the Markov factorization property. And they are all the same things, but slightly talked about from a different perspective. So first of all, if the, the theorem for these properties here So for a given density P, all Markov properties are equivalent. So if you have a probability distribution fulfilling the global Markov property, it will also fulfill the local one and also the Markov factorization property. And all the other connections are there too. Right? Let's start, for example, with the last one. So that it's factorizing along the graph. right? And factorizing along the graph, you can then show that it will also fulfill the global Markov property. So the new thing might be here's a local Markov one. So what is that one? So that's like, here are all possibilities listed with all possible subsets. And in the local one, it tells us that we don't have to consider all of them. We just need to show that each variable is independent of its non-descendants given its parents. Okay, so the blocking um, set are the parents and we need to show that a variable is independent of all its non-descendants, right? The descendants are the ones that I can reach by following the arrows, starting from a certain variable. Those are the descendants. And I'm excluding those. Of course, they are depending, they are dependent on all of the descendants, so I need to exclude them. <coughs> but for all the others, the parents are kind of um, isolating a variable. So here's my variable x in the center, and here's maybe parent 1, parent 2, and parent 3. And maybe there are other variables in here as well, right? So here's another one. There are some descendants, blah, blah, blah. But there might be also even further variables like this. And now the local Markov property means that X is independent of everyone else given its parents. So basically the parents are blocking all the relevant paths to the other variables which are not de descendants. So suppose here's one, then we will have a V structure down here and the X will be independent of that one. Even though the parents are not blocking the paths between X and this dot here, yeah, it's blocked by the V structure. 
that is inside this non-descendant thing. Yeah. Okay, so a lot of the the theory about these Bayesian networks is graph theoretical reasoning type of index. And the proofs also look like that. So sometimes they make little diagrams or sometimes people write lo lots of text with descendants, non-descendants, and parents, and siblings, and so on and so forth. So it can get easily very complicated. So the curious thing is that the local Markov property is already enough to have a global Markov property, which is like an interesting insight, which is also non-trivial. Here's an example, uh, which is not completely worked out. So the local ones are missing. But this is my distribution, and it's Markovian with respect to the given graph here. And um, those are all Markov conditions that are possible to formulate with these nodes. Yeah, so those are all of them. So I think J and T given R, R and S given nothing, and S and J with different combinations of things to condition on. Curiously here, I'm allowed to condition on R, so that's okay. So that's blocking, by the way, the path over here. I'm not allowed to condition only on T because that would open the path along this way, right? So that's why this looks a bit asymmetric here. And then there's also the macro factorization property. And what's missing on the slides are the local ones, yeah? Which would be, um, so let's think about it. So what would be the local Markov conditions? For every node, S is, indi uh, S is independent of every non-descendant given its parents. It doesn't have any parents. It is independent of R, and it is independent of J, okay? Because the path here is blocked since we're not observing the T. So let's take the next one. T is independent of all its non-descendants. The only non-descendant which is not a parent is J, given its parent. So the R is blocking the path over here. And similar for the R, R has these two descendants. So I'm only asking that R should be independent of S, and that's the case. What about J? J should be independent of its non-descendants, which is T, given its parent R, and that's true. And also it's independent of S, given its parent. Uh, so the local property is also fulfilled in this case. Yeah. In this case, it sounds like the number of independencies for the local one is even larger than the one that we had here. However, that's only the case now. If you have a larger graph with more nodes, in principle, here you have to talk about all possible subsets, triplets of subsets, and those can be many. Okay. So far, so good. So I stress again the definition here. So that is the difficult thing today. Why is it difficult? Because it's so long and it's so like so many technical pieces here. However, let me go through it once again. So this separation is defined to be every path need to be blocked. So when you want to prove that something is deseparated, you need to write down all the possible paths between two groups of variables. And then for each path, you need to check whether it's blocked. And to check that something is blocked, you need to say there exists something along the path where it is blocked. And there are two situations to be blocked. Either you have it in your observation set or you don't, depending on the arrows. So, in drawing logic a lot, the definition of deseparation starts with a for all quantification, and then comes an existential quantification. Okay, and then comes one of the cases. This is like the definition of the lemurs in analysis. For all epsilon greater or equal, there exists a delta, blah, blah, blah. Deseparation is a very similar structure. Question. Oh, yeah, very nice. Okay, this is the perfect question. So, um, can we infer the graph? So, you are kind of now worried. Oh, do we really need the... I'm data-driven. I want to download data from the internet. I don't have a domain expert. I just want to generate Bayesian networks from data. I don't want to talk to a domain expert. Can I do it automatically? And now we learned all this nice deseparation stuff. Couldn't we infer from the independencies that we can measure maybe with HTIC or with some other algorithm and then infer something about the graph? And the answer is yes. Yeah, we can. So, for example, um, let's say you have a data set. 
and I need to switch. So you have this data set with three variables, A, B, C, and you run some tests on it and you find out that A is independent of C, given nothing. And you run a test that A is, or maybe that's it. So that's the only independence that you find out. Yeah, so A and B might be dependent and A and C um, might be also dependent. Oh, no, 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 that was the wrong one. So A and B are also not dependent. From that one, then you can infer the graph structure, right? There's no edge between A and C, but there will be an edge between... Oh, did I do something wrong? Oh, okay, stupid, okay. B is also not independent of C. So that basically means there will be an edge from A to B and there will be an edge from B to C. And now the question is, how can we orient the edges so that it makes sense? And the only way to do it is in this case like this. So we infer the graphical structure purely from data. Yeah. However, here comes the caveat. Um, how can I get a bigger one? Oh, this one, okay. Um, let's say you infer the following independencies from your data. So suppose you are inferring A is independent of C given B. And that will tell you, okay, there's no direct connection from A to C, right? Because it's separable kind of. Um, everyone else is dependent. So the graphical model must be must look like this, so the undirected graphical model. And now we have no chances in orienting the edges. So there are three possibilities. So it could be like this and like that. It could be a fork or it could be the chain in one direction or the chain in the other direction. So you cannot always solve it, but sometimes you can. And the more variables you have, somehow the better for conditional independencies. Practically speaking, the other thing is, a problem might be also an algorithm for that one. So suppose everyone is binary. Then you could, for example, take all rows where the B is equal to one and you do an H sig and you t take one where all where B is equal to zero and do a, with H sig the independency. But suppose B is real valued and then things get more complicated. And that's like an um, interesting field also where people try to define nice algorithms to calculate these conditional independencies. But it's quickly exploding because you have to look at all possible subsets. But what I just showed you is the IC algorithm and we will talk about it in two or three weeks or something. So we will infer it from the independencies. Okay, also it's interesting, now having talked about these independencies, it's an interesting way to get the graph. However, you can't do it for two variables and that's what we've seen already can be done with other algorithms. However, the older ones are the ones that we just talked about, the ones that talk about condition independencies. Okay, so far so good. Um, Markov property. Um, there are different ways that are equivalent to define this. So there's the global Markov property, which kind of says the graph is compatible with my probability distribution, okay? And as you say, there's also something going into the other direction depending on certain assumptions. Yeah? Under faithfulness assumption, we would say that we don't put, or causal minimality, we don't put unnecessary, unnecessary edges into the graph, right? So if there's a certain independency, then we better use a graph where we omit that edge, right? We can put in all edges. It's a complete graph. It's a, it's a big joint, but we don't save anything but we can omit sometimes edges and that's like something called causal minimality, which I think I defined in a second. Okay, but before that, um, very related to what we just defined, um, given a graph, we can define the set of probability distribution which is Markovian with respect to that graph, okay, that are compatible with that graph. We say two graphs are Markov equivalent if they have the same probability distributions. And for example, for two nodes, uh, the error going one direction or the error going the other direction, those two graphs are Markov equivalent. They induce the same probability distributions. In particular, the fully connected graph 
or any fully connected graph is Markov equivalent to any other fully connected graph because it's where the sets M of G is the set of all probability distributions and so they are all basically Markov equivalent. Okay. So now comes another interesting theory. Given two graphs, can I have a graphical criterion to say that two graphs are Markov equivalent, right? It's something that is defined via the probability distributions, but I can have a graphical criterion. And the criterion is they should have the same skeleton and the same immoralities, okay? Whatever that means. So I show you on the next slide. So the skeleton of a DAG is basically the undirected graph that you get when you omit the directions. That's the skeleton. Okay, so far so simple. So you just forget the directions of the edge just and get the skeleton. The immorality is also very easy to memorize. So basically, if parents are not married, yeah, then there's an immorality. I don't know how 20th century this is anymore, but this is like a very intuitive notion. Okay, so A and C having a child, but they are not married. So that's an immorality. Okay, where the word immorality here now is just a word with one, two, three, four, five, six, ten letters, and it doesn't have any other meaning here. Okay, but it's easy to memorize. Another word would be a V structure. Okay, so that's in a way the same. If you have a V structure, you don't have a connecting edge. But sometimes, ah, uh, okay, not I'm not sure whether a V structure already applies in immorality. Anyway, let's flip back to the theorem. Okay, the skeleton should be the same. Yeah, that kind of makes sense because those are like the direct independencies. If there's not an, so if there's a, not a connecting edge between two nodes, probably there's some way to separate them with some certain observations. So there is a way to condition such that they get independent if there's no direct edge. Okay, so that kind of makes sense. And the immoralities are exactly the ones where everything is very specific where we have a very specific effect that two nodes are independent given nothing, and when we observe it, they get dependent of each other. So those are the special ones that make it clear. Okay, so far so good. Um, here is a more sophisticated example of Markov equivalent class. So those are two graphs on the left and on the middle, and those two graphs are almost the same. Only one edge has swapped over here yeah, at a very boring location. And those two are Markov equivalent. They define the same set of probability distributions. Thus, sometimes we also um, visualize it as a CP DAG. Okay, so this is a partially directed acyclic graph. And what is the C? I forgot. Okay, so it's um, only partially directed, this one. So there are some edges that don't have an edge. And so the directions that we keep are the ones where we have V structure. So here's a V structure. And by getting rid of the directions, it's really changing the factorization. Similarly, here's a V structure. So that one is also important. Okay. So um, we could also discuss whether flipping, other flipping the edges here would not change something. But for example, flipping Y to Z would generate a new V structure then there would be an immorality between y, z, and v, right? So y uh, from v to z and y to z would be a v structure if I flip that edge. However, then, then there would be an immorality between y and v, but the theory says the immoralities must be the same. So that's why I cannot flip that one. Also, x and y cannot be flipped because then I have a cycle. Yeah? So there's this kind of reasoning involved here in these graphs. Okay, so far so good. Um, next one. So there's also the so-called Markov blanket. And the Markov blanket is the subset of nodes that isolates an, a variable from the rest of the nodes. So we had this um, thing with the local Markov property where we are independent of everyone else but the non-descendant, uh, but the descendants, right? However, here we want to be isolated from everyone, okay? And it turns out the smallest set that basically the smallest set M, which makes us independent of the rest, is the set of parents, the set of children, and the set of the parents of the children. Okay? This could be also visualized like this. So here we are talking about the node A, and everything that's in the blue blanket 
uh, in the blue area is the, in the Markov blanket, which is like the parents up here. Then we have the children of A, and like the, yeah, those are the unmarried husbands and, and wives in this case, okay? So they are also in here. And if you observe those, then you are independent of the rest. And as I said, it's the smallest subset. Of course, if you say put everyone in the subset, you are also independent of the rest because there is no rest, right? But you are looking for the smallest one with that property. And here you see, like, here are certain paths which are all blocked. Here's a certain path. Uh, the, here are certain paths with the descendants, which you need to block by observing the children. Otherwise, you cannot be separate from the nodes down below. However, once you observe that one, you are connected to your... Um, yeah, yeah, to your wife or husband or whatever, right? So you need to observe those as well. So that's the Markov blanket. And again, a definition, and you can prove how it looks like. Yeah, I don't prove it here now. Okay, here's an interesting book from 1956 from a physicist, Hans Reichenbach, and he wrote this interesting book, The Direction of Time. Physicists are always interested in these kind of questions as well. And I think when you stu study the law of, of Newton in physics, basically physics can go backward and forward, right? So there's no direction. The laws go forward and backward. So basically, if you throw down a cup of coffee, coffee and it spills all over, in principle, you could run it backwards and the cup of coffee would jump up to the table again. However, it's very unlikely that this will happen. So there's this thing called entropy, that it's more likely that it goes like this and not the other way around. But the laws of physics that describe how everything is moving, they don't give us a direction of time. So, and the book is about this, yeah? And I'm not a physicist, so I can only give a very party-like summary of that one. However, he has a very nice, interesting common cause principle, which has something to do with causality. So his principle, and here I'm quoting the version from Jonas Peters, if I'm having two random variables and they are independent, there must be a causal explanation for this dependence. And that is a strong statement, right? So either x is the cause of y or the other way around, or as a third possibility, there's a common cause z, yeah, which is causing both. So these three things are possible. Note that causing is not really defined here. It's more used in an intuitive sense, okay? And also note, this is a principle and not a theorem, so it's not really proven because the things are not well defined. Nonetheless, it's quite interesting that to think about it like this. So if you see some things in nature and they are kind of correlated, let's say um, the number of birds in your lawn or in your garden or in nature and the number of cats around, and you see a correlation between those two random variables, then it could be that one is causing the other one, or the other way around, or there's a common cause. Yeah, a famous example is the number of storks that you see outside and the number of baby birds. Yeah, they are very, very correlated. So the number of storks went down in the last 100 years, and like in European countries, also the number of birds went down very much. So they are very, very correlated. Um, and in that case, we are probably in the case that we're having a common cause here, so that like industrialization um, has different effect on society, on the nature, okay? So there's a common cause. So far, so good. Um, when we interpret the causing now as a directed pass in a DAG, yeah, of a Bayesian network, then one can prove this principle, okay? And for this now, let's take a structural causal model with a graph. Yeah, there where we have two variables, x and y. Note that also for a structural causal model, the induced distribution is Markov with respect to the graph. That's just everything is always the same. It's always fitting. Now, if x and y are <coughs> excuse me, unconditionally dependent, so that's made this statement a little bit more precise. So not observing any other variable, and x and y are somewhat dependent, then one can prove that there must be a directed pass from x to y, or a directed path from y to x, or there is a node that is a collider along the path, okay? So we have a directed path from x to z and a directed path from y to z. The proof is quite simple, actually. So if it's dependent, yeah, then because of this Markov thing, there must be an unblocked path from x to y, yeah? And if there's an unblocked path, 
They cannot be a collider along the way because they were unconditionally dependent. Yeah? So if there's no collider, we only have the case that it goes from y to x all the way or from x to y or at one location I'm having outward pointing arrows. Okay? And the third possibility is not, not given. Because the unconditionally dependence excludes basically that there's a collider on the path. So the variables are really unconditionally dependent. Okay, so that's like an interesting proof. And it's kind of interesting, so these researchers there in Tübingen, I'm not sure where, where they found it from, but so they found this interesting Reichenbach principle, which I think pops up in philosophy. And it's interesting that with these notions, kind of you can give a proof of it, which is cute, I think. So that's quite cool. Okay, here's a nice example. We are almost out of time. Do you mind if we take a little bit longer? We started late, right? Yeah, okay, very good. So do you mind, and some of you do this, and some of you do that, and you all mean the same. That's perfect. <laughs> okay. Um, so here's an example. So that's a statement. Why are handsome men such jerks? So the examples are all kind of strange, but the, you, we learned something. Maybe we need to modernize the examples here. So my biggest problem here is what does jerk mean? What does handsome mean? Okay, so handsome means good looking, okay? And jerks means idiots, okay? So the question is why are good looking men such idiots? So that is a statement, okay? So here comes the math. So let's have one random variable for being handsome, for being good looking, and let's have another random variable for being friendly, so not an idiot, so being a nice person. And now comes the third one, so that people are more likely in a relationship if they are good looking and if they are friendly, okay? So this is now encodified by this and, logical and, and by this logical XOR, so which is basically saying, let's put some randomness. So there are some handsome and friendly men who are not in a relationship, okay? Fine. So now my model is um, basically saying, if a person is handsome and friendly, then they are most likely in a relationship, okay? So, at the beginning, H, of a H and F are independent, right? So typically, it doesn't matter whether you are look good looking or not. Uh, it doesn't imply that you are friendly or unfriendly. However, maybe it's more likely to see people when you go out that are not in a relationship, so that is R being equal to zero. So you have here some selection bias. So typically the people you see then randomly as singles running around or something are most likely not in a relationship. And for that reason, kind of there are only a subpopulation and they are the ones where suddenly these two random variables get dependent of each other, okay? So um, if we know that a person is not in a relationship, suddenly being friendly could imply that the person is not handsome anymore and the other way around. It's like an explaining away effect, okay? So this is yet another paradox, which is no longer a paradox once you make a nice graphical model and you discuss it with some probabilities. Then it's kind of not a problem anymore. So, by the way, um, this is also not a violation of Reichenbach's principle now that F is dependent on H here, yeah? since F and H are conditionally dependent in this case. So they are not con in unconditionally independent, right? But they are conditionally dependent. Only if we know that R being equal to 1, only in that case they are dependent, okay? Because otherwise it would be strange if F and H are dependent on each other, right? Unconditionally, then one must be the cause of the other or there must be a common cause. But here it's the other way around. Here we have a V structure. Here we have one and the other and the arrows going down and not the other way around. Okay, so far so good. That's Bergson's paradox. What else do we have? How much do we have anyway left? Okay, not, not much. Okay, let's finish this up. Okay, so we defined a Bayesian network to be a graph, yeah? And a, a graph together with certain CPTs, so with certain probability distributions, which define locally what's going on, okay? And such Bayesian networks is super useful to have a 
space efficient representation and it will also lead to a super time efficient algorithm to do inference in these networks. How can we make them causal? And there's a definition for that one, there's so the so-called causal graphical model, which is between the Bayesian network and the structural causal model. And the causal graphical model is another way to mathematically describe causality. However, let me tell you, with the causal graphical model, it's not so easy to do counterfactuals. Okay, you can do interventions, but you cannot do counterfactuals so easily. So what is the causal graphical model now? So a Bayesian network is called causal if the functions induce now also the interventional distributions, which in principle I could observe. So they must be compatible with interventions. Or with other words, if I have an intervention where I'm now sampling the x from a different probability distribution, then basically I should be able to write the joint as a product where I'm using all the one coming from the Bayesian network where I only replace the one for the x sub k where I manipulate. Okay, then this is called a causal Bayesian model. So a causal graphical model is a Bayesian network, which is also telling me something about the interventional distributions, but not about the counterfactual distributions. So far so good. Let's just briefly compare a Bayesian network and a causal graphical model. It should be obvious by now. And for this, let's assume the ground truth is a structural causal model where we know everything. Okay, so this is the ground truth. Then the DAG from X1 to X2, which is compatible with these assignments, that will be a Bayesian network, which is also a causal graphical model because it will induce the same interventional distributions. However, the other way around, that is a Bayesian network for X1 and X2 because the joint distribution is the same, but it's not a causal graphical model. Okay, because it's not inducing the same intervention distributions. So we see Perl's hierarchy of observing joint distribution Bayesian network. And then the next level is a causal Bayesian network. We're having interventions and we can ask more complicated questions. And then the third level is we have counterfactuals and structural causal models and we can do everything. Okay, so that's like the hierarchy. And it's also like, I guess, how these things arise. First, we have the Bayesian network, super intuitive independencies. We can do already a lot. However, for Bayesian reasonings, we need these interventional distributions, so we need to extend it a little bit. And then comes the counterfactuals, and we need to extend it even further. Okay? Good. So, quick comparison. So, the causal graphical models are nice. We can have observations and interventions, and they are somewhat simpler because we don't worry about these noise distributions, right? So we don't have these, and we don't talk about these little computer programs, which are assignments. So in a way, they describe less of how the data was generated, but only describe what we observe. That's why we can't do no counterfactuals. However, in principle, we can use causal graphical models and create a nice twin network. So by extending the number of variables that we are looking at and having like the real world and having our random variables and then we copy all variables into a hypothetical world and making a big like graphical model out of that one, then I think counterfactuals are also possible. But it's more complicated. So structural causal models, um, we can do all of the things that we want so far. However, the whole thing is a little bit more complicated. Um, structural causal models, by the way, is also not something I think that Julia Pearl invented, but that's, I think, how he defines it. But there are these structural equation models from econometrics, and I think also in social science, people looked at similar structures. So it's, I think in different, different areas, people came up with similar ideas. So what have you seen today? We looked at Bayesian networks and had the introduction because it's a basis for looking at the graphs. And we looked at the criterion of the deseparation and then we started to look at how the graphs are related to the probability distributions, that the properties of the graphs and induce something in the probability distributions. Of course, everything in the graph was defined in such a way that it's kind of cleverly matches stuff in the probability world. But it's good to distinguish the two so that they are two different worlds. Good. So far, so good. That's it for today. Thanks for extended attention. And I see you next week.